Welcome to the Specimen Not Found podcast. This podcast explores the lives and careers of clinical laboratory science professionals and discusses issues that can help inform other members of the healthcare team and the public about what makes clinical laboratory science such a critical profession within healthcare. We are your hosts, Drew Jones. And Leticia Nunez Argote. So as the current hottest topic on our planet continues to be the coronavirus, we thought we'd talk a little bit more about the different ways in which laboratories across the United States are testing potentially sick individuals. If you want to know more about how the coronavirus itself infects a person, we've put a link here for you to check out. It's a cool other YouTube video that shows how the coronavirus itself gets into our systems. We will be discussing different test options instead. Uh, first, let's talk about a couple of important concepts when it comes to determining how good a test system is. And this is the test sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is a quantitative number that estimates the smallest amount of virus the test can detect. After performing quality measures for a new test, a scientist calculate the amount of people with a disease who would, if tested, have given a positive result. And we look at this as the true positive rate. So if you have a 100% sensitivity, it means that the test is excellent at finding patients with the disease. The other factor we look at is specificity, also a numerical value, but this one estimates the ability of a test to correctly identify people who are not sick with a particular disease. So we calculate the amount of people without the disease who we expect, if tested, to have a negative result for that test. This is also known as the true negative rate. When in the clinical laboratory we're deciding whether or not to use a new test to check if a person is sick or not, we always want to verify all this information. So it's a very important part of our job to make sure when we tell somebody they are sick that it is indeed true. So, however, to do our job well, we rely on a good sample to be taken from our colleagues on the front lines. Some studies we've seen suggest that a swab inserted deep into the nasal cavity or the nasopharynx contains the highest concentrations of the COVID-19 virus. So this is what we consider a good sample and will help us actually find the virus if it's present using our molecular techniques. So scientists have figured out that the antibodies, also known as the little army of proteins that our body makes to help fight off viruses like coronavirus, appear in our blood after about 10 to 20 days. So we can perform lab testing using the sample of blood to test for antibodies, but if we do it too early in the infection, it can lead to false negatives, meaning we'd have to tell somebody that they don't have the virus, even though they may indeed have it. And so in showing this graph, uh, we wanted to make sure that we touch on a couple of things. So the first one is this blue line, it's the blue thick line, that it's actually showing the amount of uh, the virus that can be measured in the patient. So as you can see, it goes up. That means that the, per the virus is replicating and the, the concentration is growing. Uh, then, as you can see at the bottom, we have time in days. So when we talk about a person's symptoms uh, showing up, that's when we call the onset of symptoms, it usually appears about the fifth day after the person had first come in contact with the virus. So we have a big window of a few days when a person has the virus but doesn't know it because they might not have any of the classical symptoms. After a few days, you can see the green and red line coming up. And so the green line shows the concentration of uh, antibodies, we'll call IgM, which is our first line of antibodies that are gonna be showing up in response to the viral infection. And then a few days later, the production of a second type of antibody called IgG with that red line is showing up around two weeks after the initial contact with the virus. So as you can see, there's a few days where we have a virus replicating and a very few defense mechanisms showing up until about 14 days. If a person starts to recover, it's when this antibody start overwhelming the virus. As you can see about day 14, the viral count starts dropping and the antibody count starts 
increasing, this is a good sign that this person is going to be recovering. Uh, so for our purposes, as you can see at the bottom of this graph, we have in the testing realm, this three different type of test results. The PCR, which is our molecular technology, is going to be showing mostly positive at the beginning of the disease when there's a lot of virus going around. And then afterwards, we're going to start seeing some of the antibody tests become positive. And then eventually, the virus is not, not going to be detected because it's being eliminated by our immune system. And all we will be able to see is our antibodies in the blood. So now let's talk about some laboratory tests. To start off, we'll talk about the gold standard, and that's what the CDC is using, and it's known as real-time polymerase chain reactions. You'll see it as RT-PCR. And what this does is it actually detects the presence of a virus in the person's airways. As we mentioned before, we want to use that nasal specimen. For a virus like coronavirus to be detected early in the body using this real-time PCR, we have to convert the RNA from the virus into DNA. This is a process referred to as reverse transcription. We do this because only DNA can be copied or amplified, and that's a key part of this real-time PCR process for detecting viruses. So in order to do this, we take our patient sample and we treat it with sem several chemical solutions that remove substances like fats and proteins so now we only have a mix of the patient's own genetic material and the coronavirus RNA, if it is indeed present. This is where the real science starts to happen. Yay! Medical lab sciences use the viral RNA and reverse transcribe it to make a template of DNA. Then an instrument and multiple reagents are used to amplify that specific part of the transcribed viral DNA hundreds and thousands of times over. So after we've done that, we use computer technology to measure the presence of copies of the viral genetic material. And if it is indeed present, this means the test will become positive and we don't need to do any further testing. So if this person has the virus, it'll tell us and the mystery is solved. So why are we not doing this for everyone? Uh, now this technology is cost, it requires a lot of reagents for quality control. So it's important for us to have these reagents, but they're currently in very short supply. Now, if we cannot use this test, then others can be used, but you should always check with a real-time PCR test to be absolutely sure, uh, especially if the patient is currently exhibiting symptoms such as shortness of breath, cough, and fever, and they have a positive antibody test. In the world of the medical laboratory, companies like Seafood, Abbott, Biofire, and Medtronic have developed RT-PCR testing specific for COVID-19 to be done on existing instrumentation like Biofire Film Array and CFID Gene Expert um, and others. Uh, which technology are we currently using at KU Med? Drew, do you know? Uh, KU is using a, well, we have a Franken lab. So we are using some Abbott real-time PCR. We just got a Diasorin instrumentation that I believe also does PCR. But I know we have BioFire, so there's the opportunity to bring that on as well, along with the Sepia Gene Expert, but we're not doing those. So let's move on to the antibody testing platforms. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is your uh, what we call the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. Now, these tests look for antibodies made against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Any antibody test depends on how long the infection has been going on, but the ELISA tests are especially good at finding even the tiniest amounts of antibody, which is what we want. So for this particular test, the sample that we use is serum, which is the yellow liquid part of the blood. A very tiny amount of the serum is uh, diluted or watered down and mixed into a well that is pre-coated with a protein that has been obtained from the outer layer or nucleocapsid of your SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we actually buy those plates and those reagents from manufacturers. Um, so we take our patient serum, we put it in there, we let it sit a bit so that any antibodies that may be present can attach to the proteins. And then we wash out anything that has not been fixed to those proteins on the well. After that, uh, we add a second antibody, which is obtained from happy goats um, that is designed to bind to human antibodies and contains special substances that can help us measure the presence of said antibodies in the well. 
Uh, we then add some more wash solution to take out any reagents that are not participating in the reaction. And we add an indicator solution that in the presence of antibodies against coronavirus will help us measure any change using a special reader. Now, because this reaction is proportional to the amount of anti-COVID-19 antibodies present, this test can actually give you a number that shows how much antibody was found in the sample. And we love numbers. They are so definitive. Yay. Speaking of numbers, uh, just looking at one of these ELISA, I went ahead and found the sensitivity and specificity for IgM and IgG testing. Remember, they will change based on where you are in your infection process. Uh, but the true positive rate or the sensitivity for IgM for one of these systems was 45%, with a specificity of 97. And the other one for IgG had a sensitivity of 100% with a specificity of 100%. Now, that 45% probably stands out to you, but just a little caveat on that. The positive samples in these studies were tested two weeks after the onset of symptoms. And this would explain why our IgM test was not that great as it started starts dropping after 10 to 14 days, as Letty explained earlier. Other quick things about some of these tests, uh, not so much for the real-time PCR, but for the ELISAs and the rapid lateral flow assays we'll talk about here in a sec. Most of these tests have not been reviewed formally by the Food and Drug Administration, and the negative results from these tests don't necessarily rule out COVID-19. Follow-up testing with molecular diagnostics, i.e. the real-time PCR, should be considered to rule out infection in individuals who are still showing strong symptomology. Um, other false positives may result if the patient has a current infection with some of the non-COVID-19 corona strains out there. We've known about corona for a while because it typically causes common cold. All right, so we've talked about those. Uh, now let's get on to our third option, which is a rapid option, which is lateral flow assays. What's good about this is this one takes a few minutes, whereas our ELISA testing and our rapid real-time PCR take a couple hours to even a few days, depending on how big of a batch your facility has. So that's one of the appeals to the lateral flow assays. But just to give you an idea, if you've ever run a pregnancy test or ever really seen it at work, they run on the same technology. And we've put a link below that you can click on to watch this. And it shows the principle for these tests, which are known as immunochromatography. And this is the separation of components in a mixture through a medium using capillary force and the specific and rapid binding of an antibody to its antigen. So for our COVID-19, to look for those antibodies in a patient's sample, we either use serum or whole blood. And we apply this to a small section of the cassette. These tests contain a membrane, which is pre-coated with a happy mouse anti-human monoclonal antibody that are designed to detect either IgG or IgM type antibodies, and we'll have two separate test lines for these. We'll apply the sample and dilute it to help give, get the system going. The mouse anti-human antibodies will bind any coronavirus antibodies present and form a complex. The sample and the antibodies will then move across the cassette using capillary action, and if any of our coronavirus antibody is present, the test line will capture these complexes, and this will cause the test system to develop a colorful line. This colorful line indicates a positive antibody complex. So if there is no coronavirus antibody in the sample, it will just go through, but you won't have either the IgG or IgM line come positive. Again, this type of testing, we do need to back up with real-time PCR. And that is because the sensitivity and specificity for these isn't always great. Here's Letty on that. Indeed, the sensitivity and specificity for this lateral flow assays varies widely based on the manufacturer. Uh, typically, they will fall in a range between 89 and 99% for both specificity and sensitivity. Now, none of these tests so far have received formal FDA approval, so the numbers on their specificity and sensitivity are relative and completely based on what the manufacturer claims that they can do. They are currently being used only for clinical laboratory applications and should not be used for home testing. I repeat, do not get these online and do it at home. You really do need these to be performed by a professional. However, a good uh, advantage of these is that the results are available 
within minutes. A fourth system that we were able to find out there is uh, the new Abbott point of care test, the ID now of COVID-19. It is an automated assay that utilizes nucleic acid amplification technology to detect the SARS-CoV-2 viral nucleic acids. Now, this test is going to be using a template, which is similar to the primers we talked about in the real-time PCR, and is going to amplify a target region of the viral RNA. A fluorescent labeled molecular beacon is then used to specifically identify the amplified RNA targets. And if the RNA is identified, then the test will be positive. Now, Abbott has not released as of today in this recording that we could find a sensitivity or specificity number. One advantage, however, is positive results may be detected in as, as little as five minutes. And for negative results, they indicate that they're confident of the negative result within 13 minutes. So this is a brand new technology that's just coming out there. And again, you have to be very careful with that because we don't have a lot of information about that. Right. And this ID now, like some of the Cepheid, Gen X, and the other instrumentation out there already existed for like group A strep and influenza testing, but they developed new test systems so it can test for COVID-19. So in summary, uh, the results from our antibody tests shouldn't be used alone to diagnose or exclude COVID-19 infection. Really what's making the difference of what facility has what comes down to price, availability, and capacity of the clinical labs handling the test systems. In the absence of capacity to test with real-time PCR, facilities are turning to the ELISAs. And if those two are still not doable, they can do the lateral flow assays is a rapid test and then any positive they get from there confirm at a larger facility with the real-time PCR. Uh, a lot of places that do have the capability and the facilities are indeed running real-time PCRs. As we mentioned before, they already had the instrumentation, whether it be the Cepheid, the BioFire, the Gen X, and have just bought the testing kits for COVID-19 for those instrumentation. But really, uh, what we're ultimately trying to do is conserve testing for the people who really need it. So we've heard a lot of people saying they're not getting their test results back quickly, even though, as we mentioned, some of these test results can come back in minutes. After all all this, I don't feel comfortable telling you a definitive amount of time you're going to get it. The biggest limiting factor is testing capacity. And you have to remember, you're not the only person getting this testing done. So... Uh, If you are currently waiting and in self-quarantine, stay there, stick it out. Everything's going to come out at the end of this okay. Just some numbers I was able to find around our area in the Midwest, LabCorp, Quest, ViraCorp systems are taking about four to five days to turn around test results. And then our hospitals, again, depending on what testing setup they have, is anywhere from 24 hours to four days. So I hope you find this information helpful. Um, I hope, again, you will connect with us. You can find us at, on Facebook at, at KUMC CLS Program or visit us at cls.kumc.edu. Share this podcast with all your friends and family. And for now, this has been Specimen Not Found. I am Leticia Nunez Argote. And I am Drew Jones. Wash your hands. Stay safe.